Hey, it's Dr. Asatar Bear with part three of my series of lectures all about the history of money. Uh, this one is about fiat money, that is paper money that is non-convertible, all right? That cannot be redeemed or converted into any set amount of any commodity, gold, silver, whatever else, all right? So recall from my previous lecture that a lot of the history of banking is about banks' attempts, various attempts, to mitigate the risk of collapse. Mitigate the risk of collapse, because that, that risk of collapse is ever-present with the fractional reserve system. We, we talked about the development of central banking, the relationship uh, that banks develop with the government um, and what they like from the government again is the ability to suspend convertibility. Uh, now this initially when this occurs historically these are experiments. They are associated experiments. They're usually associated with some kind of disaster, some kind of war almost always war, right, because war is just so ruinously expensive, right? Now, so example, let, let's, uh, let me just throw a couple of these out here, okay? So, for example, the United States, okay, uh, the U.S. during the Civil War, uh, the Civil War was a lot more expensive uh, conflict uh, than anyone thought it would be, right? So the United States introduced a new currency, uh, in order to pay these war expenses, and that currency was called the greenback, all right? Now, the greenback was initially convertible, right? Like, I mean, the problem with introducing a new currency specifically to run up a huge debt is what makes people have confidence that you're actually going to pay it back, right? Uh, so initially, the, the greenback was convertible uh, to, to gold at a, at a set rate, right? Um, and in addition to that, it also paid interest. So it's kind of like a some kind of hybrid between a currency and a, and a bond. Uh, but it was also intended to be a means of payment. Anyway, uh, Greenback only lasted a few years, right? Because what almost immediately happened, I mean, as the, as the government paid for the war and ran up huge bills, um, they, they suspended the convertibility almost right away. And then the Greenback lost about 62% of its value, um, you know, within about a year and a half or so, like very, very, very rapidly, right? So, you know, these these experiments with suspending the convertibility universally end in failure, okay? So, the, now what do I mean by that, by failure, right? It means either the currency was destroyed by the operation, it was either it was retired, or the, the, the experiment ended by going back to convertibility, going basically back to some kind of gold or silver standard. So there is not a single historical case that I know of, that I've ever heard of, that doesn't involve abject failure. Uh, so it's odd, usually when experiments fail, they're not repeated, right? But it's odd that we see this attempt made historically again and again uh, to, to do this, right? Um, Probably the most famous example um, is, is uh, so secondary example here, is Weimar Germany. All right, so Weimar Germany, this is probably the most studied case uh, of hyperinflation ever. This is, you know, in a lot of economics textbooks. So what happened here is, um, you know, the... Uh, 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 Germany, in order to, to fight World War I, okay, so what they, they didn't call it World War I at the time, right? Of course, they just called it the Great War. Um, this is a, a major conflict uh, in Europe. Uh, goes from 1914 to 1918. And the, what the, the German uh, strategy in order to pay for this war was debt, okay? They're not going to raise taxes. They were, they, they were just going to borrow, right? Um, and so... Uh, German strategy, use debt in order to pay for the war. And that borrowing had a big impact on the value of the currency. Okay, so, you know, whenever 
uh, governments borrow a lot, it raises the question in the mind of the bondholders, are you actually going to pay this debt back, right? So, and sometimes that shifts the value of one currency relative to the other, okay? So just to understand what happened uh, in this particular historical case, let's compare it uh, to the dollar, okay? So in the United States, we're a little more familiar with that currency, okay? So the beginning of World War I, the dollar uh, was equal to about 4.2. Uh, uh, the German currency was called the Deutschmark, all right? Or the mark for short, okay? So the 4.2 uh, Deutschmarks for a dollar, right? Um, now, as the war proceeded, that that uh, changed, okay? So we get to uh, a situation where, you know, the Deutschmark has depreciated quite a bit during this period against the dollar. Right now, a dollar buys you 7.9 marks, okay? So that is a, a devaluation of the mark relative to the dollar, a uh, very significant one, okay? But when Germany loses the war, of course, things get worse, right? Because, you know, th when they still had a possibility of winning the war, the Germans could say, well, we're going to, uh, you know, get all this new territory and we'll have much more economic power and so forth, right? Don't worry about the debt, right? When they lose, that gets reevaluated, okay? So, and the mark pays the price for that, right, in terms of losing value, okay? So by, the, by 1919, we get to a situation where $1 now buys 48 marks, right? That's pretty significant change, right? Wow, right, a, a, an eight-fold increase in the number of marks. That's meaning it's now a little bit less than one-eighth its previous value from not that long before, right? This is 1914. And here we are, uh, 1919, only five years later. Wow, that's a pretty big change. But even bigger changes are to come, right? Because what happens, of course, is there's a treaty, the Treaty of Versailles. Germany is saddled with the debt. And they, um, you know, they, they are saddled with the debt, not only their own, but also they have to pay, um, you know, reparations to the uh, countries that they that they fought against, right? So they have to pay reparations, and these reparations have to be paid in a a currency which is tied to gold. Okay, so we had the, the Deutschmark split into these different components. Okay, there was the they suspended their gold standard at the time. Okay, so we had a paper mark, right, non-convertible, uh, and then we had a gold-backed mark. And of course, the the uh, the allies the here looked for payments in the gold market. They're like, oh, we're, no, we're no fools. We don't want the the paper one that you can control. We want the one that's tied to gold, right? So, however, right, they thought they were being smart by doing that. But, however, the thing is, right, everything is connected to everything else. Okay, so what what the Germans then did was they printed a lot of paper marks to then buy hard currency, right? to buy gold, to buy the gold mark. Um, and that created massive inflation, okay? So within just a, a few years, this has now gone to 90, okay? And a year later, it stands at 320. Not long after that, it's at 7,400. And at this point, the, the uh, German state goes into default, right? They can no longer make their payments, uh, the French and, and, uh, and Belgians uh, invade and briefly occupy uh, Germany. Anyway, this ends up settling at 4.2, get this, trillion Deutschmarks, whereas before it had been 4.2, right? An increase of a trillion fold. Unbelievable, right? So, and this is because they're just so much printing, right? They, the government is locked into a kind of pattern where they are printing money to pay their debts, shifting the burden to others in the society. Right? Very, uh, very devastating case of, of inflation. All right? uh, in order to get off the hook of this debt. Um, all right. So, uh, suspending convertibility. The point is, this is not a good idea. Right? It ends in failure. Um, now, in addition to 
these kind of emergency suspensions of convertibility, banks also look for laws that limit the convertibility, even under good times. All right, laws limiting convertibility. So let me give you a couple of examples of this, right? Banks push for this. They, they, they look for, for example, you know, you, you, have this, you have this issue in the United States history. Okay, there's, a, there's an era before centralization, before there's a national currency. This is called the free banking era in the United States history. All right, free banking. This is when every bank, each bank, issued uh, their own notes, okay? That is, there were many different kinds of money. There was not just one kind, right? Every bank is issuing their own notes, okay? So, and the notes have an exchange rate relative to, to each other, right? Even though they're all nominally tied to gold, right? Because at the time, this is, be, this is you know, under, under the era of the gold standard. What would happen is, there was a trade, a speculative trade, in every bank's notes, right? So example, some banks were more risky, okay? That is, they issued a lot more notes than other banks, right? They took greater risk. And remember, what, this, what we're talking about here is the risk of default, right? The risk that, that more people will want the, to redeem the notes than can actually be redeemed at any given time. Right now, that's a risk that every bank has. Right, every fractional reserve bank has that possibility. Not all the notes can be converted at once, but you know there's varying degrees of risk. Right, like if you have ten thousand ounces, forty thousand notes, that's less risky than if you have ten thousand ounces and a hundred thousand notes. Right, so some banks have the reputation of being more risky. Right, and what speculators would do during this era is that speculators would buy their notes at a discount because if the market knows or even rumors that this bank is taking a lot more risk well then their notes their money is worth less than that of other banks which are known to be less risky right so speculators would buy the notes at a discount and then convert them convert to gold right the banks would use their old excuse right i love it uh, history's most audacious excuse don't you know we're dealing with a gold shortage? We don't have the gold to just get anyone off the street. Uh, gold? Look at this. This is ridiculous. And so this is what they do, right? They, they lobby for these laws that say, no, we don't want to give the gold to these speculators. Look at what they're doing. They're trying to reveal our insolvency to the market. No, we won't have it, right? And so they, they begin to, to do this, right, to stop this, right? They say, okay, we'll have a minimum amount uh, that we will convert, right? We'll have a minimum amount that we'll convert, and the minimum amount is one of these bad boys, all right? I don't know if you can understand what I'm drawing here, but this is a gold bar, right? A gold bar, whoa, that's pretty heavy, pretty expensive, right? Uh, this is this is gold bullion right here, right? A bar of gold bullion. Wow, right? What is that? What would that be worth, like, in today's dollars? A lot, right? This... This might be worth four hundred thousand dollars, right? Just just to give you an idea, right? If this is the minimum amount that can be converted, so oh, we're not dealing with any anything smaller than this brick of gold right here. That's going to cut out almost everybody, right? That's going to make it very difficult uh, for any individual to to convert, uh, you know, their their paper into gold, right? That's what I'm talking about. Laws that limit the convertibility. Now, there's limits that get introduced on the other side in the early 1930s, okay? So, for example, laws which say the maximum amount of gold which, is, which you can legally hold in your possession, you can hold no more than $100 worth, right? And so you can see these are like the two blades of the scissor right here, right? Like, if the minimum we're going to convert is a brick of gold, that's worth a lot more than $100, and the maximum amount you can own is $100, well, you can't own one of these things, uh, one of these things legally, right? So you've really cut out, right? You've you've limited convertibility to basically nil, right? I mean, no, and no individual is allowed to do this, right? So convertibility basically shifts from the individual level. Individuals don't do it anymore. Uh, corporations, whatever, to to governments, right? So governments 
still convert. Governments still exchange gold uh, for reasons that we'll, we'll explore in a minute. All right. Um, all right, let's see. Okay, so at the time, the, the, we, we get to the 1930s, 1920s to 1930s, the United States dollar is tied to gold, but in, in, a much, um, in, in a way that is much less strict than in the past, right? Like I said, laws have limited convertibility. We have had different experiments of spending the convertibility and so forth. Uh, and uh, the United States has had several different iterations of central banking by the 1930s. So at this point in U.S. history, the deal is this, right? One dollar is nominally and on the books equal to, convertible to, one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold, all right? That is the deal. But like I said, it's not a deal that people are more likely to take advantage of because there's all kinds of legal restrictions, okay? So... It's kind of like a gold standard in name only, right? It's, it's like, yes, okay, on the books, this is like this, but, but in, in real terms, your ability to con convert is, is severely limited, okay? Um, it, where it takes place is in terms of international settlements, okay? So international settlements, right? So, and for this reason, sometimes this is called the international gold standard. Okay, so let's just for example, let's let's say the United States and France engage in trade, right? And in this trade, there's both imports and exports. Okay, and let's say in the United States, uh, imports uh, three hundred uh, million dollars worth of stuff from France. Okay and exports to France only 200 million, right? Well, this would create a negative balance of trade. This is called a trade deficit, okay? So $100 million. And at the end of the year, you know, the, the France would say, okay, uh, yeah, this is fine, right? Uh, this is okay. At some point, though, they want to settle it. Say, uh, excuse me, Monsieur Great, you owe us 100 million of your dollars. We will take our payment in gold. Of course, right? Because they want something that is a real asset, a tangible asset, okay? So trade imbalances of this sort, trade imbalances are settled in gold. Now, one of the interesting things about this system is that it can be changed, right? So governments in the 1930s sometimes would change the relationship between their currency and gold, right? And this is called devaluation, okay? Uh, and there were very solid reasons to devalue your currency, okay, which we'll get into shortly. Just to, just to kind of complete my sketch of the historical picture, uh, what's happening at the time, right, in, in Europe. What's happening in, in Europe, you know, we have, we have World War I, uh, we have World War II, we have the upheaval of the 1930s, uh, and so forth. We have the, the Russian Revolution. Uh, so this is a, a time of, um, you know, a great deal of conflict and, you know, jockeying for position uh, among the different imperial powers of Europe, right? The question is, which one will dominate the world, okay? So the uh, competition... Uh, among the world powers. Okay, so the uh, the British, the French, uh, the the Germans, the Russians, uh, the uh, you know the the um, the Spanish. You know they, they they're kind of on the wane, right? The Spanish and Dutch at this point are are not serious contenders, right? But What's, what's happening is that this competition between world powers it exists on many different fronts, right? So sometimes this, this takes the form of outright war, right? So as in the case of World War I, like we talked about, right? Sometimes this is more like economic warfare, okay? So that is creating structures 
practices, rules, etc., which are designed to advance that same agenda. Okay, so so example, right? Long used uh, among different European powers, uh, the use of tariffs. Okay, and you know these days we would call these differential tariffs, right? That is giving certain countries lower tariffs. Okay, so what is this? Rep uh, a tariff represents a tax on trade. Uh, in practice, it's almost always a tax on imported goods. Okay, so remember that imports is a negative in terms of spending. Okay, so the more taxes you place on that, the more you raise the price of imports and then discourage uh, people from consuming them, right, by raising the price. Okay, so differential tariffs is an important tool you know, if you're if you're trying to dominate your your peers, the other industrialized nations, you might say, "Hey, you are an ally, right? I like what you're doing. Keep doing that. Low tariffs, right? You, I don't like. You have competition. I don't like it. You're gonna have high tariffs, right? You might even go further and put quotas. You might say, "Look, this is this, this is the limit of what's going coming into our country. That's it, right? Or you might even go the furthest you could and say sanction." We're not trading with you at all. Not only that, we're not trading with anybody who trades with you. I mean, that would be going even further, right? So you could, you could try to organize everybody to obey this kind of sanction, okay? Now, you might also do some devaluation. Sometimes these devaluations become competitive, right? So all of these are different aspects of economic warfare, right? So I mentioned World War I, the aftermath, the, the reparations debt that Germany had to pay and so forth. Keynes weighs in on this, right? Keynes writes a famous essay. Um, he's basically unknown before this, uh, right? And his, his essays about the economic consequences of the peace, right? So basically arguing that the debt that's placed on Germany is, is too high to meaningfully be paid and will probably cause problems, which Keynes was right about, right? That does cause problems later on, right? So we get to... Uh, 1936, uh, where Germany invades Poland, and the beginning of this second great conflict uh, in Europe, World War II, okay, so all the way to 1945. Okay, but this entire era going from World War I uh, in the teens, okay, so 1914 to 18, and then moving into the 1920s and 1930s, right, which includes the Great Depression and so forth, right, this whole period sees a lot of economic dislocations, uh, a lot of economic problems. Uh, okay, so the, the impact of the Great Depression uh, and World War II, for example, global trade plummets by about 90% during that period, right? So global trade, if we, we, we get through this, right, countries have devalued their currency, uh, the Great Britain, for example. So the, the country that is arguably the greatest world power at the time, right, is Britain, you know, the British Empire, right? So Britain at the time has, if any country can be said to have a truly global currency, it's Britain, right? There, uh, the sun never sets on the British Empire, right? So the British pound, the pound sterling, right? This is as close to money that you could take anywhere and it would be accepted almost anywhere in the world, right? So what Britain does in the early 1930s, in 1931, they, they change the relationship between the pound and gold, right? So they devalue the pound quite significantly, right? By about... 24% relative to the U.S. dollar, right? And that happens very, very quickly, right? They, it's devalued even more if we look at it relative to gold, about 35% uh, relative to gold, okay? So that's a very significant devaluation that occurs very rapidly, okay? Other countries follow with this, right? The, the early 1930s is an era where countries suspend their gold standard, they go off the gold standard. Okay, so by the end of 1931, 23 countries 
have gone off to gold standard. They've gone off to gold standard, right? So how does that work, right? Going off to gold standard, what does that mean, right? That the worthless paper, right? The, the thing that has universally been a failure every time it's tried, right? You, we try to go, we try to not have paper money that's be that's convertible. What happens? It fails, right? There's the European powers have tried this before, right? It's not just the Civil War. I mean, I mentioned a couple of examples, right? But these examples go way back, right? I mean, they go back to the early 1700s and the the first central bank of of, uh, of France and John Law. And there's many, many historical examples. Like I said, they all end the same way. They all they are all failures. Uh, why then do all these countries go off the go go off the gold standard? Uh, well, you know, it, it facilitates a lot of things, right? Again, like I said, there's good reasons to devalue. By devaluing, so what's the what's the point of that? Devaluation, at one stroke, you have just made all imports into your country more expensive, right? And probably what that means is the value of imports that you're you're taking in is probably going to go down, right? Because Fewer people are going to buy things that are more expensive, the law of demand, right? And at the same time, it makes your exports cheaper, right? So probably what will then happen, right, other thing being equal, is the exports are going to increase, right? This gives your economy a boost. So there's good reasons why countries want to devalue, right? Um, but if everyone devalues... You know, it's one of these things, it's like a bullet, once you fire it, other other country can fire back. They could also devalue, right? So you're going to make your, your currency cheaper, we'll do the same, right? And then you're back at square one. Because then your imports are, are you know, not, the, the, the other country's goods are now cheaper, right? You're, you're back where you started, okay? So this is, all this is going on, right? By the time we get to the end of World War II, Countries are like, that's it, we've had enough of this, right? We've, but can we just go back to having stability, to having peace, to having trade proceeding on an orderly basis? Can we, let's go back to that, right? Let's, let's try to create, this is what they want to do, right? Create a new international order, right? That is a set of rules and institutions that is going to govern global trade, okay? So, it used to be gold that did that, right? Gold provided its, it was its own rule, right? What was the rule? Well, you couldn't do a bunch of nonsense with gold, right? You, because gold is hard to get, right? You have to, you have to mine it. You have to refine it. You can't just, you can't just create it out of thin air, right? Nobody has that, that magical wizard's cap or whatever. Gold imposes a certain discipline, right? So we had to create a new kind of international order. Right now, so the the countries of the world, the industrial powers, the allies, get together in a small New Hampshire town. Right, if you don't know where New Hampshire is, it's in New England, right, United States. So they go to a place called Bretton Woods. Right, and there's a nice hotel there, a ski resort. Okay, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in the United States of America, uh, and the uh, representatives of the leaders of the world at the time, right? So Winston Churchill sends his representative, which is John Maynard Keynes, right? The famous economist, right? Uh, 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 FDR, right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt sends uh, his team of negotiators, including Harry Dexter White. Uh, uh, Joseph Stalin, right? Sends, sends his negotiators, so forth. So they send their representatives to this conference. And in this conference... They hammer out a new uh, global order for trade, okay? So a couple of interna international institutions come out of this. One of these is called the International Monetary Fund. All right, that's the, the IMF. <clears throat> the other one is called the World Bank. Okay, IMF, World Bank. And but probably the, th the thing that most people look for when they talk about Bretton Woods is a set of agreements where the countries of the world agree to peg their currencies to each other. Okay, so it's, a, it's called a currency peg or a set of currency pegs. So where, for example, the way this would work is, 
let's take the British pound, okay? So one British pound. Uh, a currency peg means it stands at a set ratio to the U.S. dollar, okay? So this one I happen to know, right? Well, at the time, one British pound, four U.S. dollars. And so by, by creating this agreement, they're saying, well, we're, going, we're committing to that, right? We're going to defend this in, in global markets, okay? And this is set up to be equal to uh, the other cur great currencies of the world, right? The French franc and so forth, right? Now, you know, many, many countries were, were part of this agreement, you know, 44 uh, different nations. And this goes into effect, has to be ratified, goes into effect in 1945, okay? The Bretton Woods system. So the, the system needs a certain linchpin, right? That is, why should these countries do this, right? Remember I said there's good reasons why countries want to devalue. Uh, what stops them from doing that, right? Well, what stops them is that the U.S. dollar is pegged to gold, right? Now, the U.S. has actually devalued at this point. So the, the gold is worth one forty-second of an ounce, right? So... But still, right, four U.S. dollars buy you four forty-seconds of an ounce of actual gold, right? And so the United States is able to very credibly say the U.S. dollar is as good as gold, okay? It's as good as gold. The United States is able to say this because the United States is itself an economic power. They are a military power. They em emerge from... Uh, from World War II as a military power. And not only that, by the way, right, they also have very large gold reserves, okay? So the United States has over 8,000 metric tons of gold, right? So they can very credibly say, look, anyone who wants to trade in U.S. dollars for gold can do, can do so at this rate, right? Now, again, we're not letting the average person do that. No, 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 we, we, the countries do it, okay? So if there's a trade imbalance, the United States we will give you some of our gold, okay, in exchange for that. So you don't have to worry about that. We can now create a regime of stability, okay? We're not going to have devaluations. We're not going to have the chaos of that. We're not going to have the, the competition and jockeying and all this stuff, right? We're going to have a stable regime of international trade, okay? And that lasts for some years, okay? This lasts until the early 70s, okay? So you you got a period of almost 30, 25, 30 years here, almost 30 years where this lasts, okay? And this is a period of expansion, okay? This is, this period right here is the post-war expansion period. Uh, what happens in 1971 is that U.S. President Nixon uh, says, we love everything about the Bretton Woods system. We want to keep this system. We love it. There's only one little thing that we're going to change, right? Remember how we were giving you 142nd of an ounce of gold uh, for one U.S. dollar? Well, we're not going to do that anymore, right? That's the part, that's the only part we're cutting, okay? The rest of it we want to keep, about the dollar and its relationship with the pound and, you know, other currencies get added, right? Even, even countries which are on the other side of this conflict, like Japan, the Japanese yen, well, that gets added to the Bretton Woods system, the Deutsche Mark, all of this stuff, right? So, you know, these, these, are, these aren't, aren't signatories to the original deal, but they, they say, they see, yes, this is a good idea, and they, they become part of the Bretton Woods system, right? They ratify it anyway, uh, later, you know? Um, okay, so President Nixon ends this, right? He said, ends uh, what is often called the international gold standard, okay? Ends the Bretton Woods system, and we enter a period of financial and currency chaos, really. I mean, that's what happens in the early 70s. So there's inflation. Countries are fluctuating freely relative to one another. Um, but what, what this means from the perspective of our, uh, our, our overall economic theory is the countries of the world, right, they were, they were holding U.S. dollars, okay? So other countries were doing this. They accumulated reserves of U.S. dollars, okay? Now, you never want to accumulate a reserve. What does this mean, right? It means a pool of assets, okay? So a bunch of money that is U.S. dollars. 
Now, you never want to have assets that are non-returning, right? You want them to always be interest-bearing. You want to have a return for your asset, okay? So usually the choice of the asset here is bonds, okay? And by accumulating reserves, U.S. dollar reserves in the form of bonds, what this allows the U.S. government to do is to run huge deficits, right? Um, and these deficits begin to pick up uh, at this time, okay? So the U.S. dollar becomes what is called the global reserve currency. The global reserve currency, okay? So that is the central banks and even the private banks, you know, in a lot of countries maintain reserve balances in U.S. dollar denominated assets, most of them bonds, okay? The global reserve currency. Now, there's another big reason why the U.S. dollar retains this status, or, or let's say gains and then maintains this status, okay? And that has to do with oil, okay? So the United States is a, is a pioneer in the, in the oil market, okay? So a lot of the tech, technology for oil discovery, oil exploration, oil development, oil drilling, oil refining, all this stuff, right? A lot of this technology was first created by the United States, and so oil becomes a much more important global commodity in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, but especially that escalates into the 1950s, 1960s, and so forth, right? And so oil is denominated and sold in U.S. dollars, okay? So sometimes the term petrodollar is used to describe this situation, right? So that is, if you want to buy oil on the global market, you need dollars. So there's a tremendous demand then. Every country needs coal, right? I mean, I'm sorry, every, every country needs oil, right? Every country that wants to industrialize, right? oil is the key commodity for industrialization. So, and if you want access to oil, you need dollars. Wow, right? So for these two reasons, right? The Bretton Woods system and the rising importance of oil as a commodity, um, the U.S. displaces Britain. Britain, which, you know, did never had really an official position here, um, but the United States dollar displaces the British currency as the, the global currency of the world, right? The, the currency which, if you had to just pick one, right, and you didn't know what country you were going to be in, what, what kind of currency are you going to bring with you? Um, it's the U.S. dollar, right? That's, a, that's the greatest uh, chance of being accepted anywhere, okay? What this all means in terms of our different eras of, of monetary history, right? I said, look, we talked about, we can talk about three eras of, of money, okay? The first of these, the commodity money era. The second, the era of paper money that is convertible. Well, we, in 1971, the world, at, with kind of one stroke of the pen, right? When, when, when Nixon ends the international gold standard, we enter into globally a new place, right? That is the era of paper money that is non-convertible, okay? The United States no longer makes this promise. You don't get 1 42nd of an ounce if you turn in a dollar. You don't, even if you turn in a lot of dollars, you don't, you don't get a, a brick of bullion or whatever, right? You, there, is, there is no set ratio between the dollar and gold or any other commodity, okay? Prices are freely fluctuating. That means it may take more dollars to buy gold. It may take fewer but that, that's, that's what market prices do. They move around, right? So that's not a standard, right? That's not convertibility. Convertibility says what makes a dollar have value is that you can convert it to a set weight of gold or silver, right? That is what makes it have value. If it's non-convertible, right? This is also sometimes called simply fiat money because, you know, the government money, government decree, right? Fiat means... By fiat means by, by decree, okay? So money has value now by decree. And that's a very, very new thing, okay? So by government decree, okay? So this is new, all right? 
we have no parallels for this, right? Like I said, the times and places in the past where convertibility was suspended, they all ended in disaster. But that doesn't happen globally, all right? So this happens globally just about 50 years ago, okay? About 50 years old. That makes it a very new development in terms of the history of money. Remember, convertible paper money is only about 500 years old versus commodity money, that's older than recorded history, right? This is, commodity money is probably 10,000 years old or more, right? I mean, it's, we don't know, it's thousands of years old. Okay, um, so th thousands of years, or 50 years, that's a very, new, very new development, right? Um, and, you know, believe it or not, Keynes actually had a lot to do with this, right? Keynes, though he lived and wrote mostly in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, you know, he died in the, in the, shortly after Bretton Woods. So, you know, he, he, he mostly lived his life during the era of, of this, right? You would think he wouldn't have much to say about this new system, this fiat money system, but Keynes actually had a lot to say about it, right? Keynes developed a lot of the theory which we use today uh, and, and Keynesian, you know, people, the economists that followed in his footsteps had a lot to say about how fiat money operates, how it works. Okay, so that's going to be what we're going to turn our attention to next is the mechanics of this, how this all works. Okay, so in, in order to, to do this, we're going to look at a modern bank and look at their balance sheet. Okay, so let's say we have a bank that has $100 million dollars in deposits, which would make it a relatively small bank, but whatever, right? This is how much money it has, okay? Recall that the rules of the central bank, okay? Central banks uh, exist to protect banks from collapse mostly, right? But they also impose rules, and the most important of their rules is to say you have a minimum reserve ratio that you're not allowed to legally fall below, okay? So, in the United States, that minimum reserve ratio is 0.1, okay? So a bank that has 100 million in deposits has something called required reserves. All right, required reserves means we're gonna take your deposits and multiply by that reserve ratio, okay? So re required reserves are equal to RR times the total deposits. All right, in this example, that is 0.1, times our 100 million. Okay, so what we would get here is $10 million in required reserves. All right, so here's the bank's balance sheet. Okay, they've got, they got 10 mil, 10, $100 million in deposits. They have $10 million in required reserves. And what that means is the maximum amount that they can loan would be the difference here. Okay, so $100 million came in. They have to keep they have to keep 10 million they're required to keep that right in their in their reserves and that means the maximum amount that can be loaned can be loaned okay 90 million dollars so recall the bank looks at it in terms of flows right what is the inflow what is the outflow okay the most profitable situation for the bank would be to have no reserves right because Remember, banks live off of interest, okay? So having reserves, this costs them money. I mean, it's an opportunity cost, right? So if they, if the maximum amount that they can be loaned is 90 million, let's say that they only loan 80 million, right? Because it's hard to make loans after all, right? I mean, you have to, people have to fill out paperwork and you have to evaluate it. Is this a good idea? Are we gonna get the money back? Should we loan you the money? I mean, hey, you know, the more someone wants money, the less I trust them. <laughs> you know, that's the paradox of lending. They'll go, oh, you really want money really bad, right? I don't like it. You know, who I want to loan money to is somebody who doesn't need it, right? Because they're the most likely to pay it back, right? So it's hard to make loans. What if you can't make 90 million, you make 80 million? Well, if 90 million is the maximum that can be loaned and you make 80 million, the difference there is called excess reserves, okay? So in this example, the, this bank has $10 million in excess reserves, right? And keep in mind, excess reserves represent 
that's a kind of opportunity cost for this bank, right? They don't they don't want that, right? That that means they they lost the interest on that, right? What might that be? Well, ten million dollars at at five percent. It depends on what the interest rate is. So at five percent times ten million is a half a million dollars a year uh, in in lost interest, right? So you can see banks don't like that. They don't like carrying excess reserves. They would like that to be zero. Uh, in fact, they would even like the required reserves to be zero as well. But that's that's very risky, right? So okay, we'll follow the rules, right? That's the rule that we're required reserves. Okay, we keep ten million. If we happen to have more than that. Conceptually, this is how we separate it, right? They'd say, okay, our total reserves are 20 million, 10 million of those are required, and the other 10 are excess, which means we could loan that, okay? So that's, this is the modern bank's balance sheet uh, in terms of how they, uh, you know, what they can do given their, their deposits. So the, the question that this all brings up is, what is money now? What is money, okay? It's not gold coins anymore. It's not pieces of paper that can be traded in for gold anytime you want, right? That's an important transitional phase. What is money, right? I mean, it's a mystery, you know? Uh, you know, I, partly it's like my job is to have all the answers, right? Um, let me be honest, I do not understand how this works, right? Anyone who does, I feel kind of questionable about, right? Because this does not make a whole lot of sense, okay? So if you're shaking your head right now and thinking, how does this make sense? Hey, I feel you. It doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make much sense at all, right? So what is money? Mm, I don't know. We'd say, well, it's kind of like this collective agreement that we have, right? Um, there is, what what gives it its value, right? Um, well, we're going to turn to that question later, right? But But if we just say, what is it, right? See, that's a very new question historically, right? In the past, you didn't have to ask that question. What is money? Uh, well, it's these, it's these furs, right? It's this tobacco. It's this salt. It's these tools, right? Why do they have value? Like, are you an idiot? Right? They have, they have value because it's a tool. You can, you can farm with it, right? I mean, that's why it has value. Or it's gold. I had to dig this out of the ground. It took me a long time. I had to refine it, right? I mean, that's why it has value, right? Because it has labor embodied in it. But that's not the case anymore, right? There's no, there's no physical item that we can point to and say that's money, right? I mean, I mean, we could, we do have cash. Uh, we have coins. But here's the thing, right? The the cash, I mean, like think about this, right? The difference between a one dollar bill and a twenty dollar bill. I mean, we, is the twenty dollar bill twenty times larger? No, right? I mean, it it's it's not twenty times more valuable because it has more paper or more of anything of value in it, right? Um, the is the is the quarter, uh, the metal in the quarter worth 25 times the metal in a penny? No, not at all, right? Uh, so that is not what gives this its value. There's no, there's no physical, it's not the physical item, right? Like I said before, these are signifiers of value. They, they are signs. They are not the thing itself, okay? So, but see, that's not all money is, right? Have you ever, have you ever uh, spent money and not given somebody actual cash, not given anybody any coins? Of course you have. That's most of the time. That's what we do, right? Uh, perhaps you you could write a check. You know that strikes you as unbelievably old-fashioned. Write a check. Are you kidding me? There's a bunch of people in line behind me, <laughs> right? But you could, right? The point is, you can write a check. Sometimes you still do for big things, for your rent or whatever. Uh, you write a check, right? What does that mean? It means that the money in your checking account. Uh, is money, right? So it can be spent. You can you can write a check and that works, right? Because remember, what is money? It's that which fulfills the economic functions of money, okay? So if it's the means of payment, if it is the uh, the unit of value, that's the dollars, the unit of value, 
if it is the store of value, then it's money, okay? But this is not even it as far as as far as that way. You, you could you could use your debit card, right? You ever do that? Yeah, me too. I do that all the time, right? Of course, these two come from the same place, right? So whether you write a check or use your debit card, what has happened is money in your checking account then goes to the money in another person's account, right? A person or business or whatever the hell, you know, whoever you spent the money with, that goes to their account, right? That's how it works, right? So what has changed hands there? Well, it's not a physical item, right? What has changed hands is data, right? But data is not something that goes in your hand, right? I mean, data, data is <laughs> information. That's something that's written down, right? Where is data written down, you know? Um, I mean, uh, in the old days, it was written down in somebody's accounting ledger, right? But that's not exactly, you know, this is not... Uh, 1805, right? This, that's not exactly how we do this, right? Where do we keep these records? Well, these records are encrypted, and they live on a network of computers that all talk to one another. That is, we call it the cloud, right? Like, okay, Paul, wait a minute. I thought you were going to explain this, right? This sounds more and more like magic, okay? So what is money? Uh, it's something invisible. It's numbers which we cannot see, which are in a secret code, which is stored somewhere. We don't even know where, right? Uh, stored everywhere, nowhere. Stored in a network of computers in a, a variety of different locations. It's so mysterious that we call it the cloud. How many people can even explain that to you, right? Just that. Uh, so what is money? Wow, okay. Uh, money is um, money is data. I don't know what to say. It's Money is information. Uh, and that is very strange, right? Because... Uh, what limits it, right? What stops somebody from producing more of it, right? I mean, what gives it its value, okay? So we're, we're talking about what is what is money, right? So you can write a check, you can use your debit card. What about, a, what if you use a credit card? Is that money? Well, does it work, right? Answer, yeah, it does work, right? Now, okay, there's a few times and places oh, we don't take a credit card or whatever. We need cash only, but these are rare, right? Most of the time, you can use any one of these, right? Um, some places actually don't take cash. They're very strange, right? Um, so, you know, the government might try to get involved and say, well, you have to accept uh, the U.S. dollar. But they, they don't usually say, yeah, but it doesn't have to be in this form. Right? It doesn't have to be the actual paper. So if someone says, no, we only take checks, then, you know, that's not, uh, that's going to be okay, right? Well, we only take whatever, right? That, so the point is, they're all taking dollars just in different form, right? So all of these things represent money. The, the Federal Reserve, United States, produces these different measures of the money supply, right? To try to get a handle on this, right? Because if money is data, well, we still want to know well, how much of it is out there, right? What is the... What is the total money supply, okay? What is the total amount of money in the economy? Uh, because this is one of our important economic statistics, right? Like I mentioned, the quantity theory of money, old idea of inflation, okay? Old theory of inflation. We want to know what is the total amount of money in the economy. Okay, so the first and easiest to understand is called M0, okay? So... M0 is also known as the monetary base, right? Monetary base, and this represents the coins and the paper, okay? The, the physical items that we most associate with money, right? That, that we can see and feel, okay? M1 goes a little bit beyond that, okay? M1 goes beyond that. So M1 includes all of M0 plus it includes all checking accounts. All right. Now, if we look at the monetary base, the monetary base is about $1.2 trillion. Okay. Okay. So if we include checking accounts, uh, we get to a total of about three, three and a half trillion dollars. Okay. So, however, that's not everything, right? What, what we want to do is we want to start including 
things which are not strictly speaking money, but they're close to being money, okay? So we, we want to include the concept of liquidity. Okay, liquidity as a, as a term, it means how quickly can an asset be converted into money, okay? How quickly can an asset, something that has value, be converted into money that is, can be spent, okay? So it's very common for us to refer to our assets in terms of their dollar value, right? So example, you might say, okay, I've got a house and that house is worth, I think, $300,000. So you'd say, that's a $300,000 house. And, the, and so well, I have $300,000 in assets. Well, you have a house, right? The, how quickly do you think you could get the money, right? You can't spend a house, you know? You can't say, oh, I wanna buy this, I wanna buy a bunch of fancy cars. Okay, I'll give you this house for it. No, that's not how it works, right? Sell the house first. I would like to be paid in US dollars, not in houses, right? So sell the house first, then give me the money. That's how we're working, right? And to do that requires some time. It's gonna, to selling a house, it's not all that easy, right? So the house is relatively illiquid, right? Because it takes a while to, to find a buyer, to close the deal, right? It takes 30 days to close on a, on a house sale. So you wanted to, to buy it right now, right? Well, it's a month from now is when we can actually get the money, right? So this is pretty illiquid, right? Versus if we take something like stocks, you got $300,000 in stocks, it's the same value asset, right? But this is a lot more liquid because it's much quicker to convert that into money, okay? So we are, we are taking note of this, right? Coins and paper are highly liquid, okay? So we're going from the most liquid that you could possibly get to less liquid. All right, as we go down the scale, okay? So M2 includes all that we've done so far, right? All of M1, which includes all the coins, all the checking accounts, all that stuff. Plus, it includes a bunch more stuff, okay? The money in your savings account. Now, savings accounts also contain trillions of dollars in assets, uh, but we're also gonna include something else, something called a time deposit, okay? So. Uh, and we're also going to include uh, money market accounts, okay? So money market accounts, all right? Uh, these are basically different kinds of accounts. A time deposit says you have to deposit money. It has to stay in our account for a certain period of time. Otherwise, you pay a penalty. So this is a, an investment thing, right? You get a higher return than you would on a savings account. But you your compromise is you have to you know, uh, commit to a certain time, okay? So M2 is another one of our measures of the money supply. M2 is actually a lot larger, right? So M2 is about $12.5 trillion, okay? So if we include savings accounts, time deposits, and money markets, look at this, we've added trillions of dollars more to this, okay? Now M3 is our most expansive definition of the money supply yet, right? M3 includes all of M2 plus an additional uh, bunch of things, okay? It's a large time deposits. So large time deposits that is greater than $100,000. Most people don't have that, right? Most people do not have liquid assets of, of $100,000, right? So this is only a few people who have this, but the few that do have enormous assets, right? So this adds a lot more, okay? Large time deposits, money market accounts by individuals, and a couple of things I wanna mention, okay? Euro dollars and something called repurchase agreements or repos for short, okay? So if we do that, then the money supply is much larger, okay? We've added several more trillion dollars, $18 trillion. So what is that? How much money is there? You know, most economists are going to use M1 or M2. A lot of economists use M2. Um, my feeling is that you should use the most expansive one that you can. I would tend to use M3. Uh, M3 has been officially discontinued. Um, 
by the Fed. The Fed came up with all of these different measures of the money supply. And in 2006, uh, they stopped reporting M3. Um, uh, so, you know, this, but, but other economists are still able to construct it. Okay, so the different measures of the money supply, all right? So we're using money supply as a concept, right? The total amount of money in circulation. But to some extent, this is kind of arbitrary. Where do you stop, right? Because, like I said, there's assets out there that are very liquid, right, like stocks. You know, the, the, the capitalization of the U.S. stock market, it's worth about $25 trillion. Is there some reason why that's not considered money, right? Like, I mean, it's fairly liquid. I mean, you can, you can sell a stock and, and be able to spend the money within a week, certainly, right? They take a few days, the stock has to settle, and then blah, 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 right? But within a week, you can, you can spend that money. So, however, we don't, we don't count that, right? That's not, that's not part of any of these measures, okay? And the Fed acknowledges, look, it's kind of arbitrary. You know, where do we stop? Uh, there's other assets that we don't include, right? We can include the bond market. The bond market is over $30 trillion. That's not considered money either, okay? So, you know, there's a little, there's a little bit of an arbitrary quality. Right? We, we cut it off here. Uh, we could go further and include more stuff. The reason that I mentioned... The, the euro dollars and the repos in this section, okay, is because these operate as loopholes, okay? So I'm gonna say more about this later on, but basically what this allows banks to do is to get around the issue of the reserve ratio if they want to, right? There's certain times when banks would like to get around that. Basically when the economy is doing well, that's when banks would like to use this loophole. When the economy is doing poorly, banks will often hold reserves far in excess of what their required reserves are. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. My next lecture is going to be about monetary policy, and we'll get into the theory and how, how this stuff all works together. Thank you very much.